The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. I noticed in the program that I have an hour and 45 minutes. That's uncharted territory in the PCA. If I were in the OPC, it'd be okay, but... It is a great delight to be here. I love Greenville Seminary. And I love the godly men that have instructed the next generation of faithful pastors and missionaries and leaders. And I love the fact that in these difficult days in which we live, we have the hope of glory exemplified and made incarnate before our eyes right here. Let's pray. Father, as uh, we come now, I pray that you would quicken us uh, to the great task of the kingdom that you've laid before us in these difficult days in which we live. We are a bit overwhelmed by how fast and furiously the changes in our culture have come, the changes in our world have come. But we know that none of this is a surprise. In your good providence, you purposed for us to be here at this time, for us to be your servants in this day, and thus we do not lose heart. We praise you and thank you for the great assurances and certainties that we have in the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Peter writes, Beloved, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, therefore I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors, as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. These are words that Peter wrote to pilgrims as applicable in our day as ever before. It was nearly a half century ago that I first began to make my way through the little classic, My Utmost for His Highest, by Oswald Chambers. Now, Oswald Chambers was by no means an exemplar or paragon of Reformed theology with his uh, Keswickian view of sanctification and sometimes his odd takes on the Old Testament, but He was converted under the ministry of Charles Haddon Spurgeon and was profoundly influenced throughout the whole of his life by a lifetime habit of reading the sermons of Thomas Chalmers. 
At any rate, my utmost was the very first devotional I'd ever read. I was a brand new Christian. And it had an immediate, powerful impact, an enduring impact. Very quickly, I found that a host of uh, the memorable phrases of Oswald Chambers had made their way uh, from the pages of that little red hardcover book into my daily conversation. Broken bread and poured out wine, not knowing whither. Prayer is the greater work, the strain of waiting. We're made for the valley. Do what is not your duty, listening in the dark. Day after day, I found that his wisdom to be pungent and picturesque, enabling me to taste and see some of the profoundest truths of the gospel that I had never seen before, never imagined before. There was one little passage that particularly bolstered my faith then, and I've thought about it ever since. It shaped my vision. It uh, emboldened my faith. It, it, it bolstered my imagination. It It uh, hastened my thinking, and to this day, it gives trajectory uh, to my sense of calling. It's based on uh, Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abram. Abram receives his call. He leaves Ur of the Chaldees, makes his way to Haran, and then eventually to Canaan. He comes to Shechem. And the Lord shows him the land of promise that is before him. And then we're told that he went on through the hill country to the east of Bethel. And there he pitched his tent between Bethel and Ai. Chambers, in his uh, devotional, has an entry on January the 6th entitled... True worship is based on this particular passage. The whole entry is probably necessary for a full exposition, uh, but the opening lines of the second paragraph serve epigrammatically as a summary of his argument. He says, Bethel is the symbol of communion with God, and I is a symbol of the world. Abram pitched his tent as a pilgrim between the two. Chambers goes on and he explains that we all have to pitch our tents where we will always have quiet times with God, however noisy and fractious uh, our times with the world may be. There are not three stages of the spiritual life, worship, waiting, and work. Some of us go in jumps like spiritual frogs. We jump from worship to waiting and from waiting to work and back again in no particular order. God's idea, though, is that the three should go together. They were always together in the life of the Lord. He was unhasting and unresting. It is a discipline, he says. We cannot get there all at once. And when I read that passage years ago, I was struck by the rare wisdom that it contained. Indeed, all these years later, it remains rare wisdom. Finding a proper balance uh, between heavenly concerns and earthly responsibilities is never easy. Uh, most of us, particularly in these dark and difficult times, are torn between two bad Benedict options. Benedict Arnold, the betrayal of complete acquiescence to the culture, or Benedict of Nursia, hiding ourselves away, hoping that it'll just all quiet down sometime soon, maybe before the grandchildren graduate from high school. The truth is, is that God has called us into the midst of this fractious world. We're constantly tugged between piety and practicality, between devotion and duty, between communion with God and calling in the world. Like tending a well-groomed garden or 
or making a fine meal, honing a balanced biblical worldview involves the drudgery, hard work, arduous labor on the par with our call to the ideals of faith, hope, and love. And somehow we have to mix those together. It involves the certainty that we are called to work and serve and love in this poor fallen world while simultaneously maintaining the certainty that we are merely pilgrims journeying on our way to the celestial city. To pitch our tents between Bethel and I, I think is a profoundly biblical way of describing our a call to be in the world, but not of it. To never quite be home until we're all the way home, but to never bifurcate or dichotomize our callings into upper story leaps or lower story slumps. It's a metaphor that helps me to describe a biblical worldview, a pilgrim's worldview. The truth is, as we know, the Christian view of the world and all things of the world is fraught with a very evident paradox, an appreciation for both the potentialities and the liabilities of fallen creation. For instance, we know that the world is only a temporary dwelling place. It is passing away, 1 John 2.17. And we're here but for a little while as Aliens and sojourners, now, Acts 7, 6, because we're a part of God's household, Ephesians 2, 19, our true citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3, 20, our affections are naturally set on things above, Colossians 3, 2. In addition, the world is filled with dangers, toils, and snares, Jeremiah 18, 22. In tandem with the flesh and the devil, it makes war on the saints, John 15, 18. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, none of this is of the Father. The world cannot receive the spirit of truth because the cares of this world choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Matthew 8.22. Thankfully, of course, Christ overcame the world, John 16.33, and then chose us out of the world, John 15.19. Thus, we're not to be conformed to this world, Romans 12.2, Neither are we to love the world, 1 John 2, 15, because Christ gave himself up for us that he might deliver us from this present evil world, Galatians 1, 4. Though we once walked according to the course of this world, Ephesians 2, 2, we now are to keep ourselves unspotted by the world, James 1, 27. Indeed, friendship with the world is enmity with God so that whoever is a friend of the world is an enemy of God, James 4, 4. I promise this biblical theology is going somewhere eventually. But here's the real problem, isn't it? Warnings against worldliness, carnal-mindedness, and earthly attachments dominate biblical ethics. But we're here. We're called to live in the world. We must be in it, but not of it. And that is no easy feat. As John Calvin wrote in his uh, little golden booklet excerpted from his magisterial institutes, nothing is more difficult than to forsake all carnal carnal thoughts, to subdue and renounce our false uh, appetites, and to devote ourselves to God and our brethren, and to live the life of angels in a world of corruption. A life of angels. I haven't seen that in any Presbyterian meeting in a long time. (laughs) 
And to make matters even more complex, we not only have to live in this dangerous fallen world, but we have to work in it, 1 Thessalonians 4.11. We have to serve in it, Luke 22.6. We have to minister to it, 2 Timothy 4.5. We have been appointed ambassadors to it, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Priests for it, 1 Peter 2.9. And witnesses in it, Matthew 24.14. We even have to go to the uttermost parts of it, Acts 1.8, offering a good confession of eternal life to which we are called, 1 Timothy 6.12. And the reason for this seemingly contradictory state of affairs, enmity with the world on the one hand, responsibility for it on the other is simply that though the world is in the power of the evil one and knows not God, neither the children of God, God is in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself. Through Christ, all things are reconciled to the Father, Colossians 1.20, so that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. He is worthy, worthy of all glory and honor and power and all wisdom and might and blessing forever and ever. Amen. And that's the cornerstone of our pilgrim's calling. A genuinely integrated Christian worldview has to be cognizant of both perspectives of the world, to treat them with equal weight. G.K. Chesterton put it this way, he said, what we need isn't the old acceptance of the world as a compromise, but in some way, we are called to heartily hate it and heartily love it at the same time. We don't want joy and anger to neutralize each other and thus produce a surly contentment. You ever seen a saint that looks like they've been baptized in vinegar? (laughs) He says, "We, we want a fiercer delight and a fiercer discontent. We have to feel the universe is simultaneously an ogre's castle which must be stormed and our own cottage in the wood to which we return at night to rest. And so, uh, we are called to be engaged with the world, but unengaged in worldliness. We must somehow correlate spiritual concerns with temporal concerns. We must coalesce heavenly hope and landed life. We must coordinate heartfelt faith and down-to-earth practice. We need to be so heavenly-minded that we do the earth good. That's what Peter's call to the exiles and the sojourners was in 1 Peter chapter 2. It's a great, high, and holy calling. It's called to pitch our tents between Bethel and I. Eudora Welty, a great southern matron of letters, once wrote, If you want someone to know something, tell them. If you want someone to understand something, tell them again. But if you want someone to love something, tell them a story. Now, to be sure, I want you to know something. I want you to know what it means to be pilgrims in these darkened times in which we live. That as you make your way to your eternal destiny in accordance with the good providence of God. And I want you to understand Uh, that there are dangers along the way and yet delights along the way. But uh, more than knowing this and understanding this, what I really desire 
is that you would come to love this call to pilgrimage. So, I better tell you a story. Historian and biographer R.A. Sheets has written The Visible History of Christ's Church is often hidden in clouds of obscurity. For reasons known only to God, he often chooses to conceal some of his greatest treasures, awaiting rediscovery by the church in his perfect time. Thus it has been for Pierre Vire, a forgotten giant of the 16th century Reformation. Now, if you were to ask anyone, I mean anyone who has even the scantiest knowledge of the period, who was the most significant figure in Geneva's magisterial Reformation? They would, of course, reply, John Calvin. But I'm convinced that John Calvin himself would undoubtedly reply, Oh, no, no, no. To be sure, it was Pierre Vire. It was Vire, along with his mentor and friend, William Farrell, who brought the Reformation to the city of Geneva first, beginning in 1534. Already, he had uh, brought the doctrines of grace to the Swiss towns of Orb and uh, Grandesson and Payern and Neuchâtel. He led the Genevan Disputation of 1535, and then he moved to Yvedon and Lausanne, uh, where he witnessed great gospel fruitfulness. He was back in Geneva in 1536 in time for uh, that famed, fateful meeting with the young John Calvin and the fiery Pharaoh. It was then that Pharaoh famously threatened Calvin with divine retribution if he did not remain in the city uh, to labor side by side with them. Uh, Calvin, as you know, had only intended to pass through the city on his way to Strasbourg, and he had to have been thinking in that moment, why didn't I just wait for one more truck stop? <laughs> what is less known about the incident is that it was Vire who softened Pharaoh's fulminations, persuading Calvin to stay. It was the beginning of a lifelong friendship and partnership as yoke fellows in the faith. The next year, Vire was in Lausanne, overseeing a remarkable reforming work in that city, pastored a thriving church. He helped to evangelize neighboring districts. He engaged in several public disputations with uh, Catholic hierarchs. He wrote voluminously. He survived two brutal assassination attempts, and he established the first academy for reformed theological training. Vire set about his work tirelessly, disciplining and discipling some of the brightest minds in the fledgling Reformation movement. It was Vire who discipled Theodore Beza, who eventually became the headmaster of the Lausanne Academy, and still later, that went to Geneva and succeeded Calvin. It was Vire who discipled Guy de Bray, the author of the Belgic Confession. It was Vire who grabbed two Lutherans with bright minds and bright futures and discipled them there in Lausanne before they returned to Heidelberg to write the Heidelberg Catechism. It was Vere who befriended and counseled Heinrich Bullinger, the successor to Ulrich Zwingli, and the author of the first and the second Helvetic Confessions. 
It was Veret who defended Calvin in two successive heresy trials. If you've ever read Veret's shorter catechism, you have to think to yourself, my goodness, the Westminster divines plagiarized gleefully. (laughs) When Calvin was banished from Geneva in 1538, it was Veret who was recalled to the city to do the work of reconciliation and restoration. It was Veret who sent ahead a message to Bootser in Strasbourg saying to him, get the man a wife. It was Veret's persistent intercessions that eventually persuaded the council to invite Calvin to return in 1541. And it was Veret who persuaded the obviously very reluctant and now married Calvin to actually accept the invitation. Over the course of the next two decades, Vire would serve in the flourishing gospel work in the city of Lausanne, planting congregation after congregation and seeing the city flourish He would continue to train a whole new generation of pastors and evangelists, apologists, theologians, educators, and missionaries. Whenever there was an intractable conflict or an obstinate controversy in any of the churches throughout the Swiss canons, it was Vire who was called in to restore their purity, their peace, and their loving kindness. I don't know how many times I've thought, sitting in general assembly, where are our virets? He would write a raft of vital books that would shape the Reformation throughout Europe, from Scotland to Greece, from Italy to Poland, from Navarre to Moravia, from the Netherlands to Sweden, carrying on a voluminous correspondence with frequent visits back to Geneva. He was John Calvin's best friend and most trusted advisor. But we live in a fallen world. Such gospel fruitfulness was inevitably met by fierce opposition, and persecution. More often than not, from magistrates, both local and imperial, after two decades of effectual ministry, political pressure from Bern forced Vire to flee from Lausanne in 1559. This, by the way, is a story that is repeated all throughout church history, isn't it? We're going to hear about Jonathan Edwards in a moment. The truth is, is that this is sort of the recurring refrain. Faithfulness, fruitfulness, opposition, exile. We're pilgrims. Great battles don't stay won. Vire was sent scurrying out of the city. Many feared for his life. Amazingly, he was joined in exile by all of Lausanne's pastors, all of the professors from the academy, all of their students, and hundreds of the city's congregants. It looked like people fleeing out of Ukraine. That's what it always looks like. They tasted the bittersweet truth that the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And the great blessings and rewards await those who have been insulted and slandered and sore vexed, who nevertheless persevere. Never one to indulge in bitterness, Vire embraced the truth that all those 
who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12. He knew that the heroes of the faith have always been those who have sacrificed their lives, their fortunes, their reputations for the sake of the gospel. He affirmed in his prolific sermons, correspondence, publications that in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, sleeplessness, and hunger, that the metal of our faith is most often proven. He called himself the Little Pilgrim. Geneva, amazingly, welcomed all of the refugees. Welcomed them with open arms. Vire was made the pastor of the largest church in the city, whereas rhetorically winsome, theologically substantive, covenantally minded, and expositionally rich preaching laid enduring discipling foundations. He reestablished the Lausanne Academy, now called the Genevan Academy. The city became a hive of, of vision, prosperity, freedom, and opportunity. Its reformational legacy was secure at last. And as a result... Today we have Swiss chocolate and Swiss watches and Swiss army knives. And some men might be tempted to retreat into either nostalgia or bitterness. He invested so much and he lost it all. After a quarter century of fruitfulness in Lausanne but not Vire. When five of his French students were martyred in Provence, he turned his attentions to the vital Huguenot missionary efforts in the West. In 1568, he brought the Reformation first to Nimes and then successively to Montpellier and Lyon, Marseille, Aix, and Orange. He was instrumental in the conversion of Queen Jean of Navarre, the mother of King Henry IV, he discipled Prince William of Orange, who helped the Reformation flourish both in his French and later in his Dutch dominions. As the father of the Huguenot Church, Vire oversaw stupendous growth from 12 convening churches in 1568 to more than 1,500 churches at the time of his death in 1571. If ever there was a man who pitched his tent between Bethel and I, it was Pierre Vire. Over the course of his long career, Vire authored over 50 books, many of them multi-volume works, the practical ethics of his Decalogue commentary is the guiding light of John Knox's reforming work in Scotland. His exposition of the Apostles' Creed helped Martin Bootser craft the 39 articles for the English church. His simple exposition of the Christian faith and the accompanying catechism was a direct inspiration uh, of the for the Westminster divines. His letters of comfort to the persecuted church became a lifeline to Jan Comenius and the harried Hussites during the Thirty Years' War. His Christian and the magistrate helped Nicholas von Amsdorf shape the Magburg Confession. And of course, all of them shaped Calvin and his magnum opus, constantly revised through all those years, the Institute's of the Christian religion. No wonder Vire was so deeply beloved. But to some, he was known as the smile of the Reformation. To others, he was known as the angel of the Reformation. 
So ask anyone who has even the scantiest knowledge of the period who was the most significant figure in Geneva's magisterial reformation. They will, of course, reply, John Calvin, but I'm convinced Calvin himself would reply, oh, no, no. It was Pierre Vire. Though he suffered the slanging ridicule and the torments of civil and ecclesiastical authorities, he remained steadfast in hope. He returned again and again to the surety of the power of the gospel to change change men and to change nations. And the great expectation declared in 1 Peter 2 that wherein we apprehend, he said, both a command and a promise. In that passage, the Apostle Peter was reminding the elect exiles of his day that they were but sojourners, pilgrims. They were to keep their conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they were reviled as evildoers, the revilers might actually behold their good deeds and come in time to glorify God on the day of visitation. Vire was no revolutionary. But he told his disciples that they were to follow Peter's command, to be subject to the Lord, to every human institution, including the wicked Emperor Supreme, to the governors who are sent by him. Thus the command to do good and thus the promise that they should consequently silence the ignorance of foolish people. Indeed, they were to live as people who were free, not using their freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as servants of God. They were to honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God. And honor the emperor. The array's great purpose, like Peter before him, was reformation, not revolution. He therefore encouraged his beloved brothers and sisters, oft beleaguered as sojourners, to be the best of subjects. He declared, there is no doubt that rulers are beyond compare much better served by believers who know the gospel than by any other men. Let us, by resistance and reformation, prove that true. Of course, it was the Apostle Paul who first talked about resistance and reformation. He said, do not be conformed to this world. Resistance. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. I often tell folks in our church, isn't this an incredible day in which to live? The pretense is crumbling away all around us. This is the day of the harvest when the tares and the wheat are achieving maturity at the same time. So may we go forth in the midst of this extraordinary day of opportunity as pilgrims pitching our tents between Bethel and I, inspired by men like Vire to stay the course and to stand strong. Peter says it. He says it so well. Beloved, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we cry out to you for the hurting all around us, the brokenness that we see every day, the confusion in and outside our churches. And yet, simultaneously, we are buoyed with hope. With the Apostle Paul, as he declared to the Corinthians, we do not lose heart. But instead, we put our trust in you and in the power of the gospel to change everything. We give you praise and honor and glory, the praise, honor, and glory that are your due. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.